I'm Alex Hollingshead. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Idaho and uh, a part of UDLIRN, and I will be um, hosting tonight's session um, in the UDLIRN network and learning series. And I have three amazing speakers that I will introduce, but um, so let me share this screen with you really quick. Uh, so today we'll be talking about all means all, including students with intense support needs using the UDL framework. And we have, like I said, three fabulous speakers. Um, Dr. Alisa Lowry is an associate professor at the University of Southern Mississippi, and she's also in a, a leadership board member at UDL IRN. And Dr. Joy Zabala is a co-director of the Accessible Educational Materials Center at CAST and a creator of awesome set network uh, framework, sorry. <laughs> and Kathy Howry um, is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Special Education at the University of Albert Alberta, an educational consult consultant and se sessional lecturer at several universities in Canada. Uh, and just so you know how the session is going to go, um, there is an opportunity for you to express your ideas and share questions. And the best way to do it would be via um, Twitter using the hashtag UDLIRN. And throughout the session, we will pause and um, and pull the questions from Twitter. And Brian will be uh, our amazing Twitter bridge between the Twitter world and our session. Um, and then, obviously, you're viewing the session either on YouTube or Google Plus, and then uh, or afterwards via recording. <laughs> so without any further uh, talking, I guess from my side, I will mute myself and I would invite Joy to answer the first question. Um, so UDL as a framework is recognized as framework that helps with overcoming various accessibility barriers that include physical, sensory, cognitive barriers. And ultimately it should al provide meaningful instruction um, or it should allow for providing meaningful instruction to all students. And does all really mean all? Yes. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so you'd like me to go a little more with that, huh? Yes, basically, please. <laughs> basically, when you're identifying and, and looking at the barriers to learning that any student would face, and you're using the principles and practices of universal design for learning to think about recognizing those barriers and what you would do with them or how you would lower them proactively, then what I think from my perspective you do is you move the entire um, the entire environment into a more accessible place. And then when you have students who have very intensive support needs, then you look at those individualized uh, services and supports that they may need, but you have a lot more ability to, um, I'm sorry, let me go back just one step. Um, when you've looked at, at lowering barriers for all, you're lowering lots of barriers before you even start looking at the need for those, those personal things. So some of the barriers that you would have to lower if you were thinking only about an individual student and you had not thought about the entire environment and the curriculum and everything that's happening using the, the UDL lens, then um, you would be you would have a lot more to do for that student with more intensive support needs and there should be hopefully in in building that everyone who comes here can learn here type of environment there should be some places to connect very readily to say okay so now um, I don't um, I would say that a uh, a good analogy many of you have seen uh, Michael Karen uh, Garen, Karen 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 Oh, goodness. Michael can't say it right this very yeah, minute. Yeah, okay. yeah. We get by with a little help from our friends. I mean, he has a wonderful cartoon that, that really, I think, embodies a lot of what I'm talking about here. The idea that um, if, you are, if you clear a ramp or you build a ramp and you clear a ramp, then the people who could walk up the stairs can certainly walk up the ramp, and the person who could not walk up the stairs can now or could not roll or whatever up the stairs, get up the stairs, can now use the ramp to get in too. So it, it's not that it replaces those individualized services that students with more intensive support needs have, but you're in a much better place to begin to put those in, um, in action. I don't know if that quite 
captures what you wanted me to say. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. And Kathy or Alisa, would you like to add anything to this? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll go next. Oh dear, it's funny when you get online and your voice cracks up. Um, I can't do the name. <laughs> yeah. I um, actually use that exact image that Joy referred to a lot when I talk about UDL, um, because, which, which is the idea that the, the young man in the wheelchair, he will, will not get in the building if the ramp isn't there. But along with getting in the building, he needs his power wheelchair, right? He needs, he needs more, but the more of it um, doesn't. And, and so, so here's an example for me. When long, long ago in the day, I would have kids with really significant needs, and, and most of my life, I've worked with kids with augmentative and alternative communication needs, and typically. Unfortunately, or whatever, the reality for those kids is that their challenges seem to come in multiples. Um, so they have more than one thing that is challenging them in order to speak. But those kids would get a communication system or, or more often a computer that would be their own computer and wouldn't be connected into anything that was happening in the classroom. They would, you know, they might be, and I'm they might be physically included because we have a very strong culture of inclusion in, in Alberta, um, where I'm from, but um, that inclusion might be breathing the same air, being there. Be and it wasn't until we really strongly talked, started talking about UDL um, that um, people are starting to understand that inclusion doesn't mean just sitting there doing it. Inclusion means that I have to build a ramp, I have to physically connect them to the network, I have to physically connect them to what's going on in the classroom. Um, UDL has helped me tremendously and it's interesting, today I was working um, with the school district we, and I've been here for a week, we started the week with talking about UDL and today we're talking about some really complex kids um, and the principal said, you know, if I hadn't had UDL to shift my paradigm, I wouldn't have understood what you were talking about today. So that was a real powerful moment for me. So for sure for me, UDL means all, UDL means every, and it means that we need to think about that across the variety of environments um, that I think our kids are in, but most particularly it helps for inclusion, inclusive educational environments. So that's my two cents of response to that. <laughs> Lisa. Well, I don't know that I can say anything you ladies haven't said, which is why I wanted to go third. It's so <laughs> easy to be the third. Um, but what I, what I will say is, you know, if we take it outside of, of physical support, so ramps and technology supports, computers, and we look at just basic academic supports, and we think about identifying those bar barriers in advance that um, I love Joy's analogy that you knock down as many as you can and so I think about things like visuals and scheduling and and um, all those types of supports that can be built into any academic environment and if you if you know, we know enough about kids with significant support needs that we can generalize some expectation of the types of things we're going to be facing. It's true, they're all very individually different, so you can't overgeneralize. But at the same time, we can use some of those basic characteristic things we know when we're designing academic instruction to understand that there are specific strategies and environmental supports academically and um, that support learning that we can put in place that make it easier for teachers and for ourselves when we start to design those very unique individualized supports that people need. And when we do that, and we do that in a general education classroom, when we start looking at truly how can we knock down barriers in this classroom so that more people can access the instruction, it makes it much more inclusive in the real sense of the word, meaning that people are involved, they're accessing material, they're making progress, and they're contributing and taking from the learning environment. So, I, you know, for me, I've kind of gotten to where I, I really stress those academic supports that we can create universally 
um, because unfortunately I think sometimes UDL gets stuck in some of those other physical techno, techno uh, now I can't say, it's, it's contagious joy. <laughs> but, and, and I know tonight we're going to talk a lot about kids with AAC support needs and um, so we can't, technology can't be taken out of it, but you know, maybe that's why you got the Mississippi girl on. We got to think about poor schools that don't have lots of, um, and I'm, I'm not originally from Mississippi, so I shouldn't say that. The whole state is probably saying no. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, we have to think about how to help teachers I like to think about, I should say, how to help teachers when they're designing instructional delivery and designing um, instructional environments um, from a strategy, from a material standpoint, so that we can act, so that all students can access that. So that's all I'm going to add. Thank you. So <laughs> that's a great, actually, transition to my next question. So what is it about UDL framework that makes it so promising for students with intense support needs, and how can we get teachers to recognize that and implement? Joy, would you like to start us again? No. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in a way, it's sort of, I think we went into that question a lot in the last round, which is what we are all sort of want to do. Um, but I think it's just, it's exactly that, that you're starting out with a, um, and this is a terrible hackneyed phrase, but a little bit more leveled learning learning field. Um, so that you're, when, when a student has more intensive support needs, that some some barriers that are just inherent in virtually any curriculum or any environment have already been thought about, recognized, and at least an attempt has been made to lower some of those barriers. So that when you're when you are having to really look farther for those individualized um, supports and services that are needed, and I would definitely say I would agree with with uh, um, Alisa that. It isn't. It isn't always technology, but it's you know what is it that we do? In fact, it's. I, I would probably say it often isn't technology uh, for students with more intensive support needs. That it's it's those other things. Not only that the way we organize the environments, but also the way that um, we think about curriculum and the way we think about our interaction with students in the classroom. I think all of us have seen. Um, the class within a class, which is the, you know, the class is going on and the student with more intensive support needs is over in the corner with their aide that, you know, basically goes everywhere with them and does everything. And, and, and we really want to try to not have that be the norm. Um, as I say that, though, it takes me to the second half of your question, which was, how do we get teachers to recognize and implement that? Um, and I think those are also two different things. It's, people can begin to recognize, but they often don't know what to do. Um, or even, you know, we hear a great deal about, um, well, I have these other 32 kids, and there's really not time for me to do these particular things. And I think one of the bad raps or, or misunderstood things about universal design for learning is this notion that, um, hopefully is dying, but I'm not comfortable saying that it is, that um, if you are doing uh, UDL, which I think is sort of a strange term to begin with, you know, to what extent UDL's principles and practices are um, an inherent part of what you're doing and how you work, I think is probably a little bit more realistic way to think about that. But People think sometimes, and, and I think administrators and, and for monetary reasons sometimes think about this, that if we are actually have a good universally designed environment and, and curriculum and all of those things that we don't need special ed anymore or we don't need additional supports or additional services, that that teacher in that classroom should be able to meet everybody's needs all by his or herself. And other than Brian, I don't know anybody that can do that. So, <laughs> so I, think, I think that's one of the, the things that makes makes teachers fearful in that regard of, of having a student with more intensive support needs in their classroom. We, we as teachers are trained from probably the very first class we ever go to to say, we can handle whatever comes our way. That's what we're supposed to do. We're never supposed to say, I can't handle this, I need help. So instead what we say is, no, this student should be in my classroom. 
So that I think that's that recognition piece is is something that we have to continually work on. But I think it's one of those pieces that even when someone recognizes it, there's a big leap from I recognize it to I know what to do in the situation and how to ask for the help I need. And that could be other people in the classroom. It could be therapists coming and going. It, it could be that there are certain things, and I think this is often the case, that when we think about the general ed classroom or, or the inclusive classroom, um, there's this, I would say, I think Alyssa, you used, Alyssa, you used the term overgeneralization, and I think sometimes we overgeneralize and think everything that happened, every service that a kid needs has to happen in that general ed classroom. I'm sorry, but I don't think PT has a really good place, you know, with range of motion and all of those things in a general ed classroom for a lot of reasons, not not the least of which, possibly the most of which, is the dignity of the child. Right. Mm -hmm. so. so I'm going to follow. I, I love everything Joy said, as I <laughs> and always do. I'm going to um, follow it with, you know, sort of why is UDL important for for kids with more intensive need, support needs, um, because, and, and this might be my experience uh, as opposed to the general experience, but um, I have um, seen that um, having teachers um, begin to understand that we need to think about flexible and, and multiple ways of uh, representation, expression, engagement, um, sort of frees them to think about other ways that our kids, our kids, I'm talking about kids with most significant needs, can actually enter into um, into the, the learning, can actually demonstrate the piece of what they're understanding, and can actually um, engage with what's going on. Um, I think if a teacher isn't thinking UDL and planning UDL, and you know, I get in trouble all the time here for talking about traditional classrooms, um, but if they are um, sort of planning and um, leading the learning in a more traditional way, pencil, paper, exclusively, um, you know, some um, uh, lectures, um, then. Um, it's not only our kids who aren't <laughs> going to be successful, there's a whole bunch of other kids that aren't going to be successful that way. And UDL thinking takes the teachers, it expands the teacher's way, oh, you know, if I, if I do that, and if that's okay to do it that way, well then it's not so hard to think about how I might be able to um, think of a way to include Johnny in meaningfully and purposefully, not just <laughs> not just included, um, because I've started to stretch what I understand our ways and means of reaching and teaching kids, and that to me is a real benefit for uh, teachers when I, um, uh, you know, when they're getting uh, kids that that in, in frankly in in my world. Our teachers don't have much training in how to um, uh, appropriately program for and appropriately plan for kids with significant disabilities. So um, having them do some stretching in what it might look like really sets their, um, sets their comfort zone at a different level, and then in some ways kind of shifts their paradigm of what um, what teaching is really all about. So that's some of the benefits that I have seen. Alisa. Maybe I should just leave myself unmuted, but you know I tend to do the Amen choir, so I have to mute throughout, <laughs> so you don't hear me talking throughout. Um, so a, a couple things. I want to go back to the beginning question, which was what is what is it about the UDL framework that makes it so promising for students with intensive support needs? And I'm going to go way back in my history. Um, as a, you know, when I was first learning to work with students with really um, significant intellectual disabilities. And when UDL came to me after that, 
everything in terms of principles and guidelines, all of those things that you examine as you think about the framework of UDL, for me, from a severe disabilities perspective, if you want to think about it in that terminology, it fits. You think about language, you think about presentation, you think about communication, you think about all those things. And for me, it always has just fit so naturally in the way that I was um, prepared to teach through ecological assessment, through, um, you know, individualized curricula and changing materials and manipulating materials, that it makes sense to me personally. How do we get teachers, particularly general education teachers, to see that it makes sense for the classroom it, as a whole? I think um, Kathy's right on. I was making notes as you guys were talking. And I, you know, one of the ways that we've been successful with that is when you can, can share and show, demonstrate, which is one of the things we as a field need to make sure that we're doing, um, when you can demonstrate that, that thinking and planning and implementing from a UDL perspective not only makes improvement or increases intellectual, um, increases academic functioning for, all, for students with more significant needs, but also makes a difference for all of your students, really makes a difference. If you're in an AP class, for example, and someone's struggling, if you've planned from a universal design framework, universal design for learning framework, you're going to have options. If you're in a general core class and you've planned using that framework, you're going to have options for all people, regardless of label. And the thing about the thing about it that makes it so very, I get so crazy about it, <laughs> makes me so passionate about it, is that it fits our kids too. And, you know, it fits those kids with really significant support needs as well. And I think Kathy also hit on, or maybe Joy, maybe you said this, is that teachers aren't necessarily trained in practice to consider those guys in the general loop. And so we as a field, have to demonstrate how it fits those kids too. I mean, that's that's where I currently am with that. We have to show, and sometimes, as you were saying earlier, it's not necessarily specific to setting, although we can have that conversation <laughs> at another time. But I mean, you, you can have universally designed for learning materials, you know, if you look at basic curricula. And then there's the instruction, you know, and we want to look at instruction and how that's designed as well and implemented as well. But I also, when you talked about changing how teachers think and changing how environments are, are planned for. I also think it changes for peer interaction, that when you start looking at really well-designed UDL settings, we start making those peer interactions and those peer supports so much more meaningful, which for our students is incredible. It's just an opportunity that they're not going to get in a different setting. And so we have to think about that. And there's always going to be, it's not an either or, Joy, I'm so glad you said that, because it, it, can't, it can't be that you choose one or the other. We just interviewed, and Kathy, you know this because you listened to the interview, but we, we just interviewed a, a teacher for a study and, um, that we're doing on Universal Design for Learning. And one of the things she talked about was how quickly she recognized the need to seek help outside of her classroom, the need to build a team. And so it makes me wonder if we in teacher prep still don't have it right, if we're still not preparing people to understand that educational instruction is not a solo deal. That, you know, we've got to continue as a field to work on preparing people to work as a team once they get to a school. And maybe it's our educational model that needs to change. And, you know, I, I, you know I'm looking forward. We're going to be in Indiana. I saw George was on. Um, we're going to be in Indiana next week, and that district has changed everything um, uh, to be under uh, a UDL model. And I'm so looking forward to seeing a school district that's embracing that and, and using it across the board because maybe that's a system we all need to go to. But we have to be open to these ideas and we certainly have to make sure that if all really does mean all, our students have to be in that mix. Right and planning and training and preparation, if all truly, truly means all, Teachers have to know that our students are there and they're going to be pre 
Wait, Alex said no. Was that? Okay. <laughs> no, sorry. I'm like, no? What do you mean, Alex? Yes, they have to. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs> I, think, I think she was talking to someone yeah, else. She was. Yeah, she was. Yeah. It just freaked me out when I looked over in the chat box. Okay. And I her. No, what? <laughs> Can I chime in with a, a something here, too? Before of course. I, I need to be quiet. Yeah, no, I apologize. So quiet. Don't be Brian quiet. is Brian is watching Twitter, and there were some issues with oh. freezing video, and um, oh. and he was asking me if I'm trying to multitask, and I'm not. All I'm doing is listening to you. I have no idea oh, what's happening now, on though. Twitter. But speaking of which, there is a question you um, you were talking about in the chat box. So do you mind bringing it up, please? Uh, me? Yeah. Oh yes. Uh, so on the so the so the Twitterverse is uh, alive and popping, and um, uh, Sue Harden at S Harden twenty two asked a question, um, and I threw it in the chat box. Um, so when you're working with new teachers, what words of advice would you give them when getting started with TVDL? And that's thrown to all three. Okay. I'll just give a really quick answer here. I would say that one of the things that I would want people to be very comfortable with is the idea that you look at look look at the guidelines, see where you're strong and where you need where you think you need some support or some growth, and then pick pick one or two things to, to move forward with. I think what happens a lot of times is people just think all of a sudden I'm supposed to be doing all of these things that are very, some of which are very different than what I've been doing in the past. So start small, look at how that's working, and as you feel more comfortable, add more. Can I, I agree, and, and, and um, there's a couple things, and this sort of goes to what I was going to say before, but one of the things that I do when I'm, when I'm talking with teachers, new teachers, whatever, is we start sort of looking through the guidelines, but also trying to unpack right now what they can do that will reduce a whole bunch, you know, reduce barriers. So I either say pick the low hanging fruit, which are the ear easy barriers to reduce, or pick one or two things that are going to make a lot of difference for a lot of kids. So essentially the same thing. Don't try and boil the ocean. Start with one or two things that are comfortable or that are possible for you, and and then um, build from there. Because the really important thing is that this is a process. It's not a it's not a place that you're going to go. Ah, you know, um, I, I, there's this wonderful beverage called UDL, and it's um, <laughs> from Australia, and it's a vodka drink. And I always have an image of it when I'm talking about UDL. I say, if you want UDL in a can, sweetie, you got to go to Australia and get it. And they do have it in multiple flavors. But, you know, it, this isn't something that you're going to do, and you've got it done, and you're finished. This is constantly a process. So any place that you start along the way will take you farther and then you come back and begin again and begin again. So, Alisa. So I'll add, um, first of all, you stole my, you're never going to be finished the tagline, but um, you know, maybe we need to come up with, you know, there's lifelong learners, so maybe we need to come up with a lifelong UDL aficionado or something. We, we need to work on that tagline. Um, at the same time, I, I think we need to do for new teachers one of the core things that we do for our students, and that is teach them how to ask for help. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, in teacher preparation, we, we teach people, or maybe you guys are all better than me, I don't know, but we, we seem to build, build people up that they, you know, you want their confidence to be good, you want them to go out into the classroom and know that they have skills, and know that they can do things, and know that, you know, they're going to be successful. And so they want to put forward that in their first job. And so I think one of the things we forget to do, or hopefully we don't forget to do, is really teach people that it's okay to ask for help. I mean, I've been teaching a long time, and I have to ask for help on a daily basis. But I don't know I, that I did that as an initial beginning teacher right. because I was scared to. It's, it's only after you kind of realize you're way over your head or you fall on your face a few times that you you understand maybe I should do that first. Also to understand where resources are. 
That's another thing we can do a better job with in teacher prep is making sure that people understand there may not be another person at your school or at least, you know, depending on where they're going to teach. You know, if they go to Bartholomew, there's going to be a whole district of people. But if they go, you know, um, somewhere where you do in the world <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly then then people may say okay UDL is technology or okay UDL is just for special education or you may hear some well, of the you know. what are you talking about well, that's what I'm saying is you you yeah. may hear some of those myths so you have to teach them how to connect through some of the wonderful resources that are out there through either this group UDL IRN or through um, cast where there are professional learning communities where they can continue to grow on that path and you know when we have them in teacher prep it's seen as an assignment so what we have to really embody somehow is that that is part of your practice and that is part of your your professional life and I'm I think we can improve on that but for starting teachers I think the most basic communication piece of help is something that we have to do and teach um, to prepare them for. And then setting up school districts that allow that to happen, making sure leadership is there, making sure that um, supports are there for teachers to ask for help and to grow. Because you're only going to ask for help if you want to grow, right? So I would can think. I, can I tag on to that for a minute? Because of one course. of us, I agree, 150%, of course. Um, you know, but one of the things that I also have kind of come to an understanding of is that, um, or one of the things I do when I'm trying to introduce people to UDL is is to help people understand the social construction of disability model rather than disability is inherent in a person and that we all come up against barriers sometimes. And then, and then I also talk to new teachers and when I'm teaching and I haven't taught an introductory on ed class for a while um, but I have and I sort of say you guys are the guys for whom the system as it is now works because if, if it didn't you wouldn't be here you wouldn't be in university you wouldn't be in college so now what I need to have, try and get to you for you to understand is what it might be like um, if that system didn't work so well and if that system is putting barriers in front of you every day, and those barriers um, are producing construct irrelevant variants in how you can, sh you know, blah, blah, blah. But it, it's really to get people to understand that idea that people were all, quote, disabled sometimes at certain times, um, no matter what. And when we start to look at the disabling factors as coming from the curriculum, the environment, the approach, then we can start to see our kids differently and that what, you know, we and believe me, I've therapied upon a few kids in my day, I tell you, but it's it's not that, that we're not going to, we shift the thing from fix this kid or send him somewhere else where he can be fixed to what can I do about the, and no teacher is trying to put barriers up in front of kids. That never is what they're trying to do. But um, become aware that maybe some of the things that I'm doing are disabling. So, yeah, you know, joy for somebody. <laughs> I'm give you a, a gold star, Kathy, for that little passionate <laughs> remark. So I think that's... Um, I agree with all of what they said, so I'm ready to ask, either ask a follow-up question or maybe I'll remember what I was going to say. I think that means move on, Alex. <laughs> all right. I have to tell you, ladies, uh, you just blew up Twitter, so uh, it's, oh it's on fire now. So a nice all job. Right. Uh, lots of lots of tweets about uh, boiling the ocean and I guess uh, I was some ask other great stuff. The ocean. I yeah. like so uh, so um, everybody that's that's watching is uh, is now blowing it up. So thanks for taking over Twitter. Good job. Awesome. Boom. All right, so uh, so Joy, you travel a lot around around the country and um, outside the country. Kathy, you provide lots of professional development in Canada and Alberta and British Columbia, right? And then Alisa, I know well, I know because I do it with you a little bit. Uh, you do research around and the country as well, all related to UDL. So that kind of little introduction was to take us sort of back. You all talked about the. Uh, promises that UDL framework has for students with more intense support needs, but from all of your from your three perspectives, 
um, in those different parts of the country or different parts of the continent, I guess, is it just a promise or is it actually being realized in academic settings? And she asked the question as though she doesn't know the answer. So. I, have no idea. <laughs> I think one of the really tough parts um, for me is that I would say that that the promise, um, in a more universal way, has has not even hardly begun to to um, take place, the or to become a reality. I I do think that there are some people in some places for some kids that this is working for um, but I, I think there's so many social issues if you will that that cause our um, cause us to be sort of reluctant to really let's all get in here and make it happen and how do we get the supports we need not just the supports for the kid but how does the environment and that's the people and the places and the curriculum and all of that how does it get the support it needs to be it needs in order to be um, that the term I used earlier was I think on a on a UDL a, a, a door where people are practicing and working on universal design for learning that there should be a sign on the door that says all who enter here can learn here <laughs> and to me that's like cool and and and, and going back to that, and all <laughs> and all means all all means each Stephen Kukic used to say yes, I like that, all, yeah. all means each and if you're not an each who what are you so um, I would say at this point no but it's not being realized but I'm hoping people will begin to put their toe in the water and I, I think there's and this is this will probably take us to a really other place and I don't want to go to this other place so is one of the, the biggest things that's keeping people from taking risks and including everybody and making these learning environments the right thing is large scale yeah, testing. The big A. <laughs> yeah. and because of the 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 um, yeah. very high stakes not just for kids but the high stakes for educators and and if you fear that a student will not test well then there, and you want to keep your job and keep being paid then there's that's a, a socially constructed huge barrier that I would love to say is going to go away but I think we have to begin to think about the other 175 days that we're not testing that we're teaching and we're inviting and including kids uh, and and think a little bit less, which I know is asking a great deal. Uh, a little bit less about those five days when we're doing the high stakes tests. Yeah, you know it's interesting. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say a couple things. Um, um, you asked about the promise, um, and yeah, we're we are far we are far from this um, being a a widely adopted practice, and and um, but. If you really think about it, we're not asking for something little. We're asking for a paradigm shift. Yes. We need a paradigm shift in education. And so um, if that happened like that, I'd be very surprised. But, you know, I get, and, and, and you know, I get shocked that there's not more classroom. After all of the talks I've done, oh, my goodness, I, my husband once asked me, haven't you talked to every teacher in Alberta about UDL? Uh, no. <laughs> but even if I have, you know, talking about it and walking with people and helping them do it is a completely different animal. So people may have hear, heard about it, but they need that at the elbow support. They need all of those kinds of things to um, to really to really make that promise work. Um, and then you know, and then we have this paradigm of assessment. Um, um, and, and I hear that all the time and our assessments really aren't high stakes. They're supposed to be assessments of the system and yet every time I talk about this, what about the, the provincial achievement test? What about, you know, um, and a, 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 a colleague from the University of Calgary said, if you know it, you know, this is, she says, well, you let them learn. You know, those are three days or a day of testing, but in the meantime, you let them learn, for God's sakes. And she's, you know, she put it this way, which I love. 
um, this is Sharon Friesen, she said, just because you think a kid is going to be thirsty in a month from now doesn't mean you don't give them water today. And that's it. We need to fill our kids as full as we possibly can every day of quality, rich, engaging learning, and then let the assessments be what the assessments will be, and for forget about it. And you know what? Um, our kids will have better off in the long run. So there's my forget about it. I'll just, my good fellows or something, right? I don't know. Whatever, <laughs> Alisa. <laughs> So I'll take it off the assessment shoulders right now for a second, and I'll say that I think um, uh, we as researchers and people in the field have a lot of responsibility here. We have been talking about the promise of UDL for a long time. We've been doing professional development on UDL for a long time, but we have not put forward models in research and literature. We have not done what we should have done in the same way that PBIS was able to grow into such a system, a systemic um, changing thing, we haven't done that for UDL and that's that's on us and that's why, you know, Alex <laughs> referred to that, that's why my work is changing because I think that if we're going to talk about it, that gummit, we've got to do it and we've got to show people that gummit, there's your hashtag Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've got to show people how to do it and how to, and I hate talking about doing UDL because I do believe it's a framework that you apply and, and it's entirely flexible and it's not one speci specific behavior that you can do and suddenly, yes, you're Miss UDL or Mr. UDL, but, you know, it's on us, guys. We've got to make sure that we're preparing people to implement UDL appropriately in the classroom in terms of teacher educators. We've got to make sure that if we are district or school level people that we are supporting that learning journey, that we're supporting that team development, that we're supporting environmental change that allows for that growth. And then just like with students, we've got to broadcast what works. And quite frankly, if you do a good lit review right now, there's not a lot of broadcasting what works. And that's on all of us. So I think we really have to work hard on that in the field if we're going to move it from promise to practice. And, you know, it's it's been a promise for a long time. If I was dating UDL, I might have broken up with them by now, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> well, I'd like to say something else about that. I mean, one of the issues, and I, and I think you're absolutely right, Elisa, especially in, in the the models part of it. And we, and we it's sort of this sense of trying to make it all real rather than here's a here's an example of this and that uh, we had a colleague from um, Australia come and talk about UDL in a minute I think several of us have had a chance to be with Leanne um, and I was lucky enough to Kathy and I were lucky enough to do a presentation with with um, with Leanne from Australia and she she did a really nice study, and they measured one thing that they were they wanted to see change because of what they did. And the one thing they wanted to see their 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 question was, will attendance increase in this group that was notorious for non-attendance if we use the UDL framework to design the the instruction and the opportunities that they have while they're here. And they saw huge differences. And I think sometimes we we want to have this this research about does UDL work rather than thinking about what is it that we want UDL to do. Um, and then then you have a little bit more to 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 um, I can't say to control all the other variables because you can't. It's a classroom. It's not always a very systematic place, but you can say this is what I'm measuring this time and I think another thing that has been an issue is the idea of what fidelity looks like when we're talking about a framework that that that's a, an interesting challenge and I think that what PBIS has done when they talk about fidelity is the same kind of thing that we need to talk about more and more and I, I believe we are talking about this at CAST and among each other and, and that's procedural fidelity that I know like like for um, PBIS they don't say 
these are the three rules you have to have wherever you are. They say, well, what are the three rules that you want to make sure that you put, put in place? So that it's more about the question that moves you forward than it is about here's the way to do it right. Because there, way, there may be many, many, many ways to do it right. And um, so I think that's another thing that we have to look at is what are those procedural issues that could be a part of fidelity? And... Um, and what do we expect to change, not only in a macro way, obviously we want, as Cass' uh, tagline is right now, learning to have no limits. Um, that learning should not have limits for anyone at any stage of their life. But as we're moving to that limitless learning scope, what is it that we're, that we're looking at changing that we can truly say, I researched whether this happened and it did, or it didn't, or why did that happen or not? So, anyway, just some thoughts. No, I agree. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. I think we, you know, that's what researchers do. Sometimes we get so involved in the minutia. Do all 31 have to be there? Do they not have to be there? Um, that sometimes we can overlook the big picture. But, you know, a bigger point for me is then once we get that, once we start getting any information, whether we're looking at the big picture, the small picture, whatever, it's on us to share that back to the field. And, 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 and you know, and, and we're doing that in terms of, I mean, today's a good example. We can talk about the work that we've done. You know, Kathy did PD today. You know, Alex and I and Kathy are all working on a study. And if we don't get that back out there, if we don't get those results out there where they can be used in teacher training and teacher preparation and in planning um, for what's next or where the gaps are, then that's on us. And we have to accept some responsibility for why, I think, in my opinion, for why UDL has remained a promise because we still debate theoretically what is UDL, you know, in some groups. And so um, that, that can be problematic when you're trying to scale it up. <laughs> So. I've often sort of asked, is is there a floor of UDLness? You know, <laughs> then we can say, okay, this is, you know, there isn't a point where it isn't and it right. is. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's really it's hysterical that it's such a flexible practice, yet we want to be so inflexible right. with how we define it. And yeah. and it's it's kind Con of a isn't to talk, yeah. it's contradictory to, to think about it that right. way. And one of the things, and I'll just throw this in because I know we're going to go to the, the questions. One of the ways that I've been trying to play at this, and, and Elisa, you you know, haven't written a paper about it yet, um, draft, <laughs> but is thinking about things like developmental evaluation and implementation science and using those ways to, because I really think we are still really in a developmental phase of this in terms of its implementation, but, but that means that we do it systematically and that we continue to um, take touch points, where are we at, how did it go, so that's the particular lens that I go at this at when I get back to it, and I'm just going to say a little thing, um, Elisa said you'd, you'd break up with UDL by now, well, I have, I've got a UDL 12 point, or 12 step program because I, it's got me. Every time I try and say I can't do this anymore, I'm right back because I believe in it to my toenails. So there I you can't go. quit you. <laughs> it's a nice therapy meeting. Can't quit you. That's right. <laughs> so we have two um, live guests at, during yeah. our uh, session, Monica and Louis, and I was wondering if they might have any questions for you. Or any answers. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Any comments. <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah. Nothing like putting you on the spot, right? <laughs> That's right. That's, so, you know. Man, go now. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> but we also have questions in the chat box, too. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, you know that as an editor, I'm going to say you need to publish your work <laughs> in terms of sharing successes. But I think, you know, Joy, you could probably speak to this better than I. CAST has some ways to really um, spotlight people, and I think the UDL IRN is developing some ways to spotlight people. But, you know, to change field, to change practice, we definitely have to get research out there um, to to speak to the powers that be and to do systemic change. That's my take, so I'll let the other ladies. 
I think it's interesting. When I was a, a first-term doc student, uh, I was also a consultant in the field, which is an interesting juxtaposition that several of us have gone through, or are going through, Kathy. But the um, <laughs> in my first, I'm lucky they let me stay because in my first term, the one of the professors who is a dear person and who I, you know, grew to love and he grew to accept me, um, what he said in a class one day, he says, you know, we have all these systematic ways that we know make a difference. We know it, and yet teachers in the field just don't use them. And he sort of put his head in his hands. Why would that be, he says. And I actually thought it was a question. And so I said, well, two things. First, first, classrooms are not very systematic places. And second, you only publish for other researchers. So teachers don't even know what you, you're talking about here. And he just looked at me and went, <laughs> but, I, but, but I do think there's some truth there because one of the things that happens, you know, and this can go, this is probably going way afield, but you, you guys that are in universities all the time don't get a lot of credit for writing, teach, writing for teaching exceptional children. You know, you, you may get a lot of credit for writing for, you know, the, the peer-reviewed journals, but those articles that teachers read and those things that teachers see and Teachers um, typically, and I'll use myself as an example in this, um, they, they don't really have an opportunity to read a lot of research journals. They know that they're supposed to say, is this research based or is this evidence based, but they don't always know what that research actually said and if it applies to what they're doing. And so I think that that's another piece that goes along with all of this is how do we how are we good consumers of the research as the research develops? How do we who are in the field working with the kids or working with the teachers all the time? How do we help them come up with what are those questions that we really want the research to answer? So that researchers then have it, it becomes that um, a partnership, kind symbiotic of. partnership, right, between practitioners and researchers that doesn't always start at the researcher's mind. It may start in the practitioner's mind, but but we don't know how to research it. So, but but it, it's it's that that sense of the the magnitude of what we're talking about, and how can we make it something that we can we can learn nibbling away. I several years ago at ATIA, I had a session. I you know, brought together a session of some wonderful researchers in the field to, to really talk about what I thought we were going to talk about was, so how do you know if research is meaningful for you? How can you be a good consumer of research? And what they talked about was their research, which was great, but it didn't really necessarily um, do what I was hoping it would do. And I maybe it's time to do another one of those things again where we talk about it from the people who are researching uh, UDL. What What is it that we're finding out that we're not finding out? What are the questions that the field actually has? So, And I also, yeah. I, I'll figure, I'll follow that up, Joy, with saying the other thing that's the onus in us is on translation from research to uh, dissemination and dissemination to teachers who won't read a research study probably because they don't have time, maybe don't even understand what you know, how to approach it. So getting you know, that doesn't mean that we don't need to do that, but we need to take that and and knowledge it's knowledge dissemination really right is is write those good studies, get them published, but then also find a way and a mechanism so that they can be uh, useful, which was what your point was, and also um, interpretable. So, you know, kind of put the UDL lens onto <laughs> the representation of the research so that um, it, it is um, uh, uh, accessible cognitively, sensorily, and in all kinds of ways to teachers in ways that will, they can actually then say, okay, I get this, okay, I know what I'm going to do with this. Right. So, that, I so think that's if I can add to that, can I add to that? Because I didn't mean 
that we do it. I, I think there's a lot of ego involved if you as a researcher think you're the only one that can can look at things or you're the only one that I mean the best questions come from the field right the bet those are the real questions the 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 issues are in the field and if I'm not in the field then what the heck am I doing right mm -hmm. so I mean I think that what we have to do teachers answer questions every day they solve for X every day in Maybe it doesn't have the rigor that we would consider to be research, but we that's where we come in in the field. That's where we assist, where we help, and then we help them get that information out there in some sort of way, whether that be through spotlighting at CAST, whether it be through a technical journal article, whether it be through you know just a newsletter, whatever we can do to support them to get that information out there, we have to do. We need practical pieces mm -hmm. um, for practical issues. And the thing is, maybe we need to look at how we're sharing information. It's a new age, right? And it's a UDL age. So maybe we as a field need to really think hard about reconstructing how these sorts of findings and and things get out there because you know there are day maybe I shouldn't say this online but it's it's kind of hard to sit down and look at regression models sometimes <laughs> you know at the very end of the day there are people who love that I understand that some days I love that but some days I'm thinking yeah I like this little splash flashy social media piece that has a connection to stronger findings and especially I want to bring us back to kids with more significant support needs especially when we think about kids with more significant support needs that information just is not out there right and we've got to get it out there in whatever format you know if I see someone focusing on their classroom saying look at what I did in a spotlight for cast I'm gonna call them and say, hey, can I come out and see what you're doing if you're in Alberta? Because <laughs> I'm okay with that. You know, because I want to, I, as a researcher, I want to know where that's happening and I want to go there. And then I want to get that out in the field. And my, so, suggestion, my suggestion is you wait for a couple of months to go to Alberta. No, yeah, I'm not. It's killing me to go to Indiana now. Are you kidding me? It's going to be in the 20s. Oh, I'm about to die. <laughs> so my point is that we should be in the field and we should be supplying that information. You know, yeah, as an editor, I love to see research journals, but I mean research articles, but at the same time, we have to make those things practical. And everything we should do should be functional. My former advisor um, years ago, you know, had a beef with the whole idea of functional education because what education isn't function? You, everything you're doing should be functional for some purpose. So, um, you know, I, I feel that about our work and I feel that about any educational work. Everything we're doing should have a meaning. So let's get to it. And we've got to start showing how these kids with more significant support needs are a part of the UDL system, right. UDL framework. And it doesn't mean when you think about those those students being a part of that framework, it does not mean that you do less of the individualized supports and services that they need. UDL is not a cost saver in the sense of we can wipe out our assistive technology department or our special ed department. It's how all of that works together that really is what makes a difference for all kids, but particularly for those students who um, are, are very often marginalized in, in even the opportunity that they have to learn. Right. Well, so I'm loving this conversation. I hate to end it, but we are at the end of our time. So I still have four more questions to ask, and I'm sure there are some questions on Twitter that we unfortunately will not be able to get to. I wanted to make sure we share with everyone the opportunity to learn more and talk more about UDL, including UDL for kids with more um, complex support needs um, during our UDL IRN Summit in March. Um, we will be in Maryland, and um, on the website udlirn.org, uh, you can find out more information, register, and 
meet in person our wonderful speakers tonight. Um, and I wanted to uh, also bring up that there is UDL chat that happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. And finally, thank you so much. Thank you, wonderful speakers. Thank you, uh, live audience that didn't get to ask questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone on Twitter and everyone who was watching. I hope you enjoyed the session as much as I did. I know I learned a lot tonight. So thank okay. you, everyone. Have a good night. Keep it coming. Thank Keep you it coming. for moderating Keep my hashtag. Awesome. Keep using the hashtag UDLIRN to ask the questions and post up. Uh, we'll be creating a Storyfy from some of the social media and then we'll be attaching the, the video, the YouTube uh, archive um, and putting it up on the UDLIRN site. So make sure if you are viewing this right now that on Saturday when you have nothing else to do, you want to watch this again because it was so very engaging. <laughs> oh my god. Absolutely. It'll be like UDL Super Bowl. <laughs>